Good afternoon and welcome to NASA's Wallops Flight Facility in Wallops Island, Virginia. I am NASA Public Affairs Officer Trent Parado, and this is the post-launch briefing for the Orbital One mission. For those of you who are lucky enough to be here at Wallops, or for those of you who watched from uh, from home on NASA TV, you saw a beautiful launch of the Orbital One mission as it began its International Space Station uh, the route to the uh, International Space Station at 1:07 p.m. today from from right here, Wallops Island, Virginia. Uh, you can follow the mission uh, as uh, as Cygnus is on orbit and begins its uh, route to the International. Space Station at www.nasa.gov slash station. Uh, here to talk about today's launch and a, and a bit of what comes next, we have a number of distinguished guests. These will provide some brief remarks and then we'll go to questions and answers. Uh, if you have questions for our uh, panelists, you can uh, you can reach out to us online on Twitter or, uh, or Google Plus using the hashtag AskNASA. Let me introduce our speakers. To my left is Robert Lightfoot, NASA Associate Administrator. Next, we have Frank Culbertson, Executive Vice President of Orbital Sciences. And we have Bill Rebell, Director of NASA's Wallops Flight Facility. And with that, we'll begin with Robert. Okay, thanks, Trent. Um, good to see everybody here. Another very successful day um, at the Wallops Flight Facility. We're really excited about getting this mission off to, in my opinion, a tremendous start. Uh, so congratulations, Frank, to you and your team and Thank Bill you. to the team here at Wallops for, for getting us started on this next mission. You know, this wasn't without some challenges. I think uh, while, while they had some challenges during the count today, as, as we always do, if you, if you back up, these guys were ready to fly back in December, and, and we had the cooling loop problem on the station, and, and the team in Houston and the team on orbit uh, went out and took care of that problem for us. Then we had, I guess I would say, some of the coldest weather we've had in decades that, that, that managed to uh, get us a day, and then if, what else but a solar flare? coming our way. Uh, but I think the team persevered through that and, and really hit a huge milestone for us at, from an agency perspective here today with this launch. And, and the birthing on Sunday of the Cygnus spacecraft is going to be really an important event for us because in so doing and, and completing this mission, this will give us two providers to the International Space Station to provide us the cargo and supplies that we need to do all the, the research and the science and the technology that we want to that we want to use this this amazing laboratory for. And coming on the heels of the announcement by the administration yesterday that we're talking about we're, we're going to start working to extend the International Space Station to 2024, it's just great news for us to, to actually take full advantage of that the just amazing orbiting platform we have up there to get us ready uh, as an agency to take those next steps um, beyond the Earth orbit to the destinations we want to take people to. So having a, the, a key enabler to that strategy is having commercial partners that can provide us those, that cargo, and today is a big step in that. So with that, I just want to congratulate the team here at Wallops and congratulate the orbital team for doing that, and, and it's just a really exciting day for the agency and for the International Space Station as we move forward. With that, I'll turn it over to the people that did the real work here. Frank, you go ahead and start. Thank you very much, Robert. Uh, it is a real pleasure to be here. It's especially <coughs> exciting to be at a post-launch press conference. Mm -hmm. uh, that's always good uh, when you plan on doing that to th on this day. Um, it was a, a challenging day, as Robert said, and, and uh, but this is what we do. The, the space flight is hard, and you have to work the issues as they come your way. And uh, you've got to stay flexible. You've got to be persistent, and uh, and you've got to pay attention to detail, no matter uh, what kind of things are coming at you from the sun or from DFOs, which are not aliens, I think. But uh, distance-focused fo uh, overpressure problems, mm -hmm. or at least analysis. Uh, but in the end, uh, I want to thank the uh, Wallops range officers, the range safety officers, the FAA, everybody who worked on this so hard, including the people who were standing out in the cold deploying the balloons uh, on a frequent basis so we could get analysis right down to the last second. And it was pretty much the last second. But it worked out and we were able to get a green and, and, uh, and proceed with the launch. I think we have some video that we can roll whenever it's ready to go. I'll try to uh, talk over it a little bit and, uh, and tell you what was going on uh, as, as we launched and then tell you a little bit about what's coming up in the next couple of days. Um, the countdown uh, went very smoothly. Um, once we got into the last 15 minutes, uh, the team was focused and ready to go. Um, all the instrumentation looked good, and as we lifted off, the uh, Antares was right on its trajectory, uh, accelerating as we expected. And, uh, and as you heard, uh, everything happened pretty much on time. Uh, it accelerates for almost uh, four minutes uh, under the first uh, stage with the two AJ-26 rockets. Uh, and we want to thank our Aerojet uh, partners for all the work they did to make sure those were ready. And uh, our Ukrainian partners from Yuznoy and Yuzmash who built the first stage. Uh, and it worked as, as planned. Um, 
We uh, uh, we heard it in the Launch Control Center. I heard that y'all had a great uh, 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 sound show, really, uh, as you were out at the uh, at the visitors uh, viewing site. Uh, when the wind is out of the east, uh, you get all the acoustics, and uh, it really brings it home what's going on. There's a lot of energy in these rockets. And that's one of the challenging things of spaceflight is you are managing a lot of energy that's uh, being transmitted very fast from potential to kinetic energy. And uh, it's all got to go right and it's got to happen at the right times. And you've got to do it over about an uh, 8 to 10 minute period in order to get into orbit. You've got to accelerate to almost 18,000 miles an hour very quickly and you burn a lot of fuel during that time. And, uh, and everything has to go right. So everybody's paying very close attention at this time. Leading up to the launch, um, we did have some challenges. Uh, a lot of it was analytical in terms of understanding what was happening with the solar flare, dealing with the uh, low temperatures, which were, uh, you can keep it rolling uh, if we have more. Uh, dealing with the low temperatures was a challenge because that's not something we expected on the eastern shore. Uh, but we could deal with it, and, and we did, and the, and the team worked together to keep things that needed to be warmed, warmed, and things that needed to be inspected, inspected. And, um, uh, and we were ready to go uh, uh, today. And uh, in fact, we were almost ready to go yesterday, but the, uh, the solar uh, flare kept us on the ground. Um, <clears throat> once the first stage finishes its job, uh, we are almost outside the atmosphere, over 100 kilometers, and uh, we separate the first and second stage, separate the inner stage, and then we ignite the second stage. The second stage on this one is a Castor uh, 30B, which is an upgraded version of the Castor 30 we flew on the first two flights, built by ATK, and we appreciate the hard work they put into that. Uh, it again uh, performed just as we expected, right on the money for second stage, and we ended up in orbit where we <coughs> expected to be. Uh, payload separation occurs about uh, two minutes after we finish the first, the uh, second stage, and that's when we all relax. Um, you see uh, the launch control team paying attention to their consoles and going through the uh, um, their um, uh, instrumentation, uh, watching what's happening. A lot of people get excited when the first stage finishes and think, "Yeah, half the work's done." Um, and but you got to remember, okay, now we got to do the second stage, and then after the second stage, you still got to get rid of that rocket and put that payload in orbit where it's supposed to be so that you can actually do what you intended to do, which is deliver cargo to the International Space Station. And we are right on the money, if not a little better. Uh, we're in a 218 by uh, 280 kilometer uh, orbit, uh, which is slightly higher than what we needed in order to be on target, uh, well above what we needed in order to do uh, extra maneuvers in order to stay in orbit. So uh, we're in good shape. Frank DeMauro, who's sitting back there, and his team uh, have taken control of the uh, spacecraft. The um, uh, solar arrays are deployed, the power is, is up and, and working, the propulsion system is working, and the spacecraft is under control. And uh, <coughs> we'll do uh, our first burn for uh, continuing, or beginning really, the, the uh, phasing with the International Space Station so we can catch up with it and, and rendezvous with it in a couple of days. That burn will occur at about, uh, I think, 6.23 tonight. and. Uh, uh, and then we'll have a few more burns as we go over the next couple of days uh, while we continue closing in on the station. The actual rendezvous will begin at about uh, 3 a.m. Sunday morning, the 12th of January. Uh, it'll take about uh, three hours for us to, to get close to the station, and then the actual capture will occur at about 6 a.m. Uh, uh, Sunday morning. And that's another exciting time for us as, uh, as you get close to the station and watch, the, uh, uh, watch your spacecraft approach up the R-bar getting closer and closer, bigger and bigger, and you think, I hope it has brakes. And, <clears throat> and the station crew knows what they're doing. And they do, and we do have brakes. Uh, last time we stopped at uh, about 10 meters, and, and they did a great job of grappling. We expect it to be the same this time. Uh, the crew will then berth us to the station, and then they will probably will wait until the following day to actually open the hatch and get their Christmas presents out. Uh, but they will, in fact, open the hatch and find a nice picture of C. Gordon Fullerton on the back bulkhead. Uh, this is the SS Gordon Fullerton, named in honor of uh, one of uh, my colleagues and, and our friends at Orbital, uh, Gordon Fullerton, who was an astronaut and also a B-52 pilot at, uh, at Dryden Space Flight Center, who dropped our, our first commercial rocket, uh, the Pegasus, uh, from the un underside of the B-52. So Orbital has a long and productive relationship with Gordon. He passed away about a year ago, and so we miss him, but we wanted to honor his memory by naming the spacecraft after him. Um, 
We've got about 1,460 kilograms of, of uh, payload uh, cargo on board this uh, uh, pressurized cargo module. Um, about 400, almost 500 kilograms of that is uh, what we loaded late. Uh, much of it was science payload. And much of it was student science, student experiments. So uh, the ISS is doing its job to continue to ensure that the next generation is interested in space flight, uh, has the ability to do research in space to get them interested, so that in about 15 or 20 years, you'll have somebody a lot better looking and smarter than us up here to talk about uh, what's going on in space. And um, uh, we, we are proud to be a part of that and to uh, assist the space station in continuing the research that's been going on for over 10 years and, uh, and continue to further the, the boundaries of human knowledge and soon the boundaries of human exploration because the station, if not actually, will virtually be our stepping stone to the rest of the solar system and uh, we're very proud to be a part of that. I look forward to your questions. I'll be happy to answer any of them. And uh, now I'm going to turn it over to our center director here, uh, Mr. Bill Robel. Thanks, Frank. Sure. Thanks a lot. Yeah, so a uh, great way to start out the new year, certainly. And we're looking forward to doing this a couple more times this yeah. year, I think. Right. And then, uh, as, as Robert pointed out, uh, with an extension of four years, maybe uh, maybe a number of years down the road after that. So that's all very good news. No, uh, Obviously, we're all smiles here, a lot of happy engineers kind of across the area. I just have to echo the congratulations uh, to the teams. Uh, they, they really worked hard at pulling this off, obviously through some pretty tough weather, um, and not all of it terrestrial-based, right? So uh, it was just a great effort across the board. Um, a couple of other things to see that are going to be taking place here at Wallops in the, in the coming months is that um, you know, we were part of one of the teams that was selected for the uh, unmanned aerial systems uh, test site designation by the FAA. Uh, so we're looking forward to the work that's going to come with that in the future. And uh, we've got some other interesting things also coming up this year. But we're all smiles here uh, as a result of the way things went here early this afternoon. Good show. Thank you, gentlemen. All right, let's uh, start with questions here in the audience. As a reminder, if you're uh, watching from home and you'd like to ask our panel a question, you can do so using the hashtag AskNASA on Google Plus or Twitter. But we'll start right here at Wallops. We'll start with Ken, and then we'll go to Stephen. We can get a mic to Ken. Hi, Ken Kramer the Universe today. Congratulations on a great launch. It was really beautiful and a great way to start the new year. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So my question is uh, for Frank and maybe Bob. Um, yeah, we did get an extension announced yesterday. So I'd like you to talk, what, what does this mean to you as an astronaut, getting an extension to the ISS, but also specifically in some detail, the point that, that Bill Gerstenmeier made yesterday. This lets the commercial providers and others uh, plan for the long-term horizon. So how will this specifically help Orbital as a cargo carrier? What, what would you like to do? Thank you. Well, to answer your first question, I think it's fantastic that uh, the uh, administration is committed to, to moving towards extending the station. I know they've got to work with the partners and there's a lot to be done yet, but uh, it's a move in the right direction. Um, I mean, in my opinion, if I had my way, we'd fly it till 2050. Now, if Congress would have to agree to that, I guess, but um, uh, there's really no reason to stop operations on the space station until it completely uh, is no longer usable. And I think it'll be usable for a long time because it's very well built, very well maintained, and, uh, and NASA and the engineers understand it very well, and I think they're operating it superbly. The best thing about it is, is it's now a research center, and, uh, and it is really starting to ramp up. It's not there yet. It's finished as a station and as a laboratory, but the research capability is just starting to, to move in the right direction. So extending it gives uh, not only commercial companies, but researchers the idea that, yes, I can do long-term research on the station because it'll be there for another 10 years and I can get some significant data. And I think that's really important for them to understand that it's going to be backed for that long. They won't get cut short uh, in the middle of preparing an experiment or, uh, or flying it. So I think that, that first of all, uh, demonstrates a commitment of the government to continue and to NASA, but also presents a lot of opportunities for a number of people. As far as what it means for us and other commercial companies is that, yes, it does allow us to plan long term for what we might be able to do providing a service for NASA in the future. Uh, and also gives us a chance to, to be innovative and maybe invest in some improvements on how we can do this to make it more cost effective, more efficient, uh, turn around time quicker, go more often, go more often, go a lot more often, Robert. And, uh, <coughs> 
and, um, and, and, you know, and, and get so good at it that they don't even feel like they have to compete for those next few extensions. We'll just, we'll just keep going. Um, that's our position, but we have to see what the government does. Uh, but it really does give us the chance to, uh, to think long term and, and make sure that we can get some return on our investment and that it actually does present a business opportunity <coughs> that can expand not just uh, to the station, but to other uses in space flight, such as exploration, uh, asteroids, Mars, wherever we're going. And, uh, and we hope it'll, move, it'll uh, transfer into other civilian uses in, uh, in space for maybe other stations will follow this one and we'll be able to participate in that. Steve, did you want to add? Yeah, the only thing I would add, the only thing I would add on, Ken, is that, that Frank said it right when he said this, the station is really our stepping stone. And, and if you think of, if you use that analogy of stepping stones, the next stone, we need, we need to use this stone to know what the next stone looks like, right? So we can get ready, whether that's research, whether it's the, what, what it does to the human body, the things we're learning today, you don't want to jump off that, that platform before you're, before you're ready. And, and so we're learning every day how to live and operate in space, and, and fortunately we're close to home, and if something comes up, we can get home. We, the further we go, the more we need to know about how to operate in space, how, what kind of protection we need, what kind of research we need for the astronauts, but also what kind of systems do we need? And these guys are putting systems up there that allow us to just test more and more, get more time, because when we get further away, we can't get home as quick. And so those are the kind of things that we get to do. And with this extension, I can now make those investments as an agency, not just us, but our academic partners, our industry partners. Yeah, the launch, the launch market is part of this, as, as these guys have shown today, but it's also the, the researchers, the scientists, even universities now can do that. I mean, if you saw the excitement today, of the, of the kids and the students that were out at the viewing area where I was for just being able to, to, to take a CubeSat, a four inch by four inch cube that's, that they've worked on and they just launched today. That's, I mean, that's pretty cool. I mean, that, that is exactly what we need to be doing and that's the people that are, as Frank said, are gonna take our jobs. And as long as they know that's gonna be there for a while, this gives them that chance to train and learn and, and do the research that we need to take people further. So that, it is the stepping stone and it's really important for us to have this extension. I spoke to them yesterday. Yeah. I think we all envy them. Yes. I think we do. Stephen. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Trent. Uh, Stephen Clark with Space Flight Now. Uh, a couple of questions for uh, Frank and uh, Robert. Uh, first, uh, for Frank, uh, the ISS uh, extension to 2024, and uh, uh, your current contract runs through the 2016 time frame, I understand. Uh, a lot more flights, potentially, for Cygnus and Antares. So beyond 2016, as you get your cadence down, uh, what sort of cost savings do you expect to be able to offer NASA uh, from the 1.9 billion CRS uh, contract? And also for Mr. Lightfoot, when do you plan to uh, recompete or extend SpaceX orbital new providers? How do, how do you foresee that mechanism working and when do you plan to do it? Thanks. Well, if Robert answers first, I might be able to give you a better answer. <laughs> Well, and I think for us, part of the whole, we, we have a, an acquisition strategy we'll go through as an agency in terms of how we go purchase these services in the future. One of the key parts of that strategy is how long, right? And so we just got that yesterday. So we're, we'll be fo folding that into our process for, for, the, for any extension that we do in terms of the, the, the service provider. So we're just now, I mean, this was part of our strategy was to get, be, First, know we're going to try to go to 2024, and then that'll fold into our acquisition strategy as we go forward. So we know we got till 16. We've got flights with Orbital and with SpaceX already on the books, and this this will actually begin to shape our strategy as we go forward. We just haven't gotten that far yet. Yeah, the, the variables are the same for both sides of the equation, yeah. whether you're the customer or the provider, and that's understanding uh, what's available, mm -hmm. how long you want to go, and and then uh, uh, what what. Uh, what is also possible in terms of, of reducing costs. Um, I can't tell you in front of these guys what kind of numbers we might be thinking about, but um, we, we definitely will go to more of a production mode rather than a development mode on the spacecraft and the rocket, and we've already demonstrated that in the company with our commercial satellites uh, that we provide for commsats and, and uh, for science use and, and other um, other purposes where we just turn them out of the factory with modifications as necessary for the customer. And we can really, we really can get very efficient with that if we can do the same design over and over. And that's what we would intend to do for the next phase of, uh, of CRS uh, services. Um, 
we would like to see uh, NASA tell us as quickly as possible what they want to do because the sooner we know, the, the, the sooner we can get other vendors, other suppliers on contract and get our plans in place to, to give them the most cost-effective solution. But, uh, but definitely this extension, I think, will help move things along. Okay, Robert, and then we'll take one from social. Hi, Robert Perlman with CollectSpace.com with a question for Frank. Um, looking at the more immediate future at um, the two flights for the later this year, can you give an update on where you are with the hardware for that for those flights, um, both uh, Antares and Cygnus? Sure. Um, our next flight is planned for early May. May 1st, I think, is the current planned date. The next one is in early October. Uh, we actually have virtually all the hardware for most of the for both of those flights, either uh, here or in process. Um, the long pole on the Antares is the engines finishing the ATP acceptance testing, at Stennis and getting the engines delivered here. Uh, we've got other cores on the way here, so we'll actually have I think four cores here yeah. uh, in about two weeks, uh, which will take us into next year. Uh, on the Antares side, um, we have the first. Uh, uh, we've got the spacecraft uh, completed through Orb 3, and Orb 4 and 5 are in work. And, um, and the PCMs have actually uh, been completed up through about Orb 6. That's the pressurized cargo module with the last two uh, going through final assembly now. Um, and then the subsystems are either on order or on dock. And so we're in very good shape in terms of availability of hardware. We'll take a question from social. Wonderful. Our first question from social media comes from Twitter user Jupiter Fix. Could Cygnus make a four-orbit rendezvous profile and dock to the ISS in six-plus hours? Mr. Tomorrow, <laughs> <laughs> my program manager is sitting back there, and the challenge I've given the team is to get there in one day. So uh, we're working on that. This really is just our first contract delivery flight, so we're, we're being a somewhat conservative. But actually, we're, we're getting there in half the time we would have on the on the demo mission already. And um, uh, if the phasing were right, we could probably do it in one day less. It really depends on where the station is when we launch and, um, uh, and what, uh, how long it takes us to, to, to uh, finish all of the orbital adjustments. But I really would like to get there in one day to, to support the science program and, and uh, get the cargo on board as quickly as possible. Let's do one more. Wonderful. Our next question comes from Twitter user Greg Beat. Did the Castor 30B, the new second stage, perform as expected? Yes, it did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's go to the phone line. Uh, I understand we have a couple of reporters there. We'll start with uh, Tarek Malik from space.com. Do you have a question, Tarek? Let's try uh, Dan Leone, Space News. Let's go back to Wallops. Any questions here? They told us it's going to be a blackout with that solar flare. Could, yeah, could, could be solar flare. Uh, any, any further questions? Go ahead, Stephen, follow up. Yeah, just a quick follow up for uh, maybe Frank. Uh, how long is this mission program to last? Uh, 30 to 45 days? What's the variable there? Uh, 30 to 45 days, and the, the variables really are on NASA's side of the equation. Uh, they've got another mission coming in uh, February, SpaceX. Uh, they've also got a Russian EVA and a Russian Progress that are coming up, and uh, so they have to work all this traffic model together. Uh, we uh, will guarantee them at least 45 days up there if they want it. Uh, right now, I think it's, what, 40 days, Frank? Uh, so we have some flexibility there. I wanted to add one thing to a previous answer, if I could. Answer, if I could. Answer, if I could. Answer. Who's that? That was you. <laughs> oh. Um, I know Trent hates it when I do this. But um, uh, we were talking earlier about the extension and what that means, and, and we talked about the um, ability to get more science up there and to, to make more plans. Um, I think another thing that we need to, to uh, push really hard for with uh, commercial cargo, commercial crew transportation, and uh, the other uh, capabilities that are coming uh, in the country is to fly more people to the space station on a more frequent basis. Uh, right now we're flying people for about six months at a time, crews of three, uh, rotating uh, in overlapping fashion, and um, uh, a crews of six in, in overlapping fashion. We may eventually get to seven, but uh, the more people we fly, the more interest we'll get in the country. And I think there's a, a, a place for people who, wanna, who need to be up there for six to 12 months for a variety of reasons. There's probably a place for people who could go up for a month, finish their experiment, and come home. 
Now, I know all you need is a little more money for transportation systems, Robert, but uh, think about it uh, in terms of how many people could then come back and tell people about what they've done and push the program and, and help, help move it forward, as well as how much experience could we continue to develop uh, in this country in, in uh, space flight. Uh, how many hours, how many days could you spend in space, and then how ready those people will be to do the long missions for exploration to the moon and Mars and beyond. So I really think that um, having a longer commitment by the station and, uh, and an encouraging uh, industry to come up with more innovation on how to uh, efficiently transport cargo and crew up there will help NASA then maybe transition to uh, a higher traffic model for the, uh, for the crews themselves. It's just my opinion. <laughs> uh, let's go back, back to the phone line and uh, see if we can get Tarek uh, Malik. Go ahead, Tarek, if you can hear me. All right, let's do a follow-up with Ken here in the audience, and then we'll, we'll go back to social. Hi, follow-up for uh, Frank. Um, yeah, Ken Kramer from first today. Talk a little bit about, you've got the, the larger Cygnus, mm -hmm. uh, Cygnus uh, uh, cargo module. What, what will that allow you to do? As, and also looking in the long term, talk about the possibilities to, to leave a Cygnus up there. Again, in relation to the fact that ISS is going to be there uh, longer now, so this may give you more incentive to develop a long-duration Cygnus. Oh, we're happy to do that. Um, yes, the uh, extended Cygnus will fly, or enhanced Cygnus as we call it, will fly on Orb 4, which will be early uh, 2015. Uh, it'll be a meter longer. It'll carry about uh, six or 700 kilograms more of cargo than the current one. Uh, which of course gives NASA more flexibility um, and, and we think it'll also uh, uh, benefit the station greatly by being able to get more cargo up there. And now we don't want to have the downside of saying, well, you, f you carry more so you fly less often. Um, uh, we just want them to do more up there so they'll need to, need to use it. But it also allows us to take heavier and denser cargo up there including water and batteries and things like that if needed. As far as staying on orbit longer, we've had discussions with NASA and other people actually about that with Cygnus. The spacecraft itself is based on the legacy of our commercial satellites that are designed sometimes for as much as 15 years. And so we've got really robust components in the, in the spacecraft with a lot of capability for, for uh, maneuvering and rendezvous, as you've seen. And so I think it could be used to support exploration. It could be used to support long duration missions elsewhere. It could also be used to test uh, systems on the station if NASA would like to do that. They could attach a stick, Cygnus, unload the cargo, and then activate a, a life support system, for example, for uh, testing for a trip to Mars or wherever they'd like to go. They could actually lock a crew in there for 12 months and see how they do, you know, and <laughs> simulate a Mars mission. I'd do it. Yeah, and I, but, but I think, to, to your question, the extension allows us to start having those kind of discussions right. in a very serious way, right? Because right. there's a lot of those, I could, there's a lot of those kind of examples. And as long as they're all aligned with where we're heading from a perspective, like Frank said, where we're heading to take people further into space, those are the kind of things, the kind of discussions we'll be able to have now um, in, a, in a much, with a much longer term view of, of where we want to go. So we're, that's what's pretty exciting about it. Let's take two more and we'll let you guys get back to space flight. Uh, we'll take one from social and do a follow up with Robert. Go ahead, Jason. Wonderful. This question comes from Twitter user Dean Ripley. Does Orbital Sciences plan on the development of a human rated Cygnus module, uh, assuming the continued success of CRS? Uh, right now, we're not working on human rating the Cygnus itself. Um, the, uh, I mean, it has a certain amount of human rating in order to be able to fly to the space station. But in terms of being able to launch people in it or to uh, return people to Earth, it's not, uh, not currently in our plans. We could make modifications, but that's a ways away. Robert. Actually, uh, since uh, the phone lines weren't working via uh, social media, Tarek Malik from space.com. Um, a question for Frank. Um, how long is uh, Cygnus going to stay at the station? Do you have a um, uh, target undocking day? Well, about 40 days is the current plan. Uh, we could stay 45, and uh, if NASA needed us to, we could probably figure out a way to stay longer. But currently, 45 is what we're contracted for on this mission. Inventive, like it. Okay, that's going to do it. Um, so as uh, as Frank said, we have a uh, we're looking ahead to rendezvous on Sunday, January twelfth. Uh, NASA TV coverage of that will begin at five a.m. for a six o two grapple. Uh, NASA TV coverage will continue at seven a.m. for the installation by the Expedition Thirty Eight crew uh, as the uh, as they berth uh, Cygnus. So, on behalf of everyone here at Wallops, I'm Trim Parado. Thank you so much. Please help me uh, thank our our panelists for joining us today.
Go Cygnus. Thank you.